Hey there, Tyson Sharp here. And if you're creating content online and you're looking to collaborate, you're looking to make it SEO friendly, and you're looking to repurpose it so I can reach the masses, this is the episode for you. Let's dive in. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Awaken Your Business podcast. And as you know, moving into 2021, business is a big topic. It's a huge, uh, it's a huge topic that we're mastering and then we're looking to learn more about. And that's why I love getting on experts, especially like Mike Begg, who's, who is just dominating in the world of e-commerce and Amazon and all these different areas. But, you know, the, the skill set of SEO and, and marketing and sales and building a team, all these things are important for, for learning and for mastering because as we move forward, things are going to change, things are going to shift, of course, but there are some topics right now that we have a clear opportunity, right? And if you're releasing content and you're doing outreach and you're looking at getting more clients, these sort of conversations and topics are really important. So feel free to take some notes feel free to implement some of the the tools and strategies that you learn here in this episode. But first of all, I want to welcome Mike. How are you, my friend? I said, I'm doing great. Thank you for inviting me. That's uh, quite the intro. I I hope I can live up to uh, that billing you just gave me. (laughs) No problem. No problem. Well, you've been, you've built in 2015, I believe you built a, you know, you started with a team of, of two other people, right? And, um, and you just went into the area of your biggest passion, which is e-commerce and Amazon, all these different things. And as, as you share your story, people learn more about you, but now you're starting to manage, I think, what did you say? 10 million in ads and a hundred million in Amazon sales. Is that right? Yes. That's what we manage every year for our clients. So we had a very good 2020 and uh, we're hoping to have an even better 2021. So yeah. And as you just explaining before this chat, I mean, there's, there's, many more people who are jumping on in the world of online business now, and especially in the world of e-commerce. And although many of my listeners won't be in e-commerce, they're definitely learning, you know, the, the, the opportunities that are online right now. And so maybe some things that you can spark within them can, you know, can tick some boxes of what they might be able to do next or what might be able to launch their business and get them to the next level. But I'd love to give you the opportunity just to share with the audience, who you are, what's your, what's your story into entrepreneurship and how'd you get to where you are now? Sure. I'm, I'm glad to share all of that. So uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Connecticut in the U S uh, I grew up there, uh, went to school in Philadelphia, graduated, started working in a big four consulting company. Uh, from there, I realized that I hated consulting. Uh, so I actually moved into real estate uh, development for Sears, a, a big retailer in the U S um, Worked at Sears, kind of saw the writing on the wall with what was coming with retail and e-commerce. And then uh, myself, my two business partners now, we started looking at ways to you know, become entrepreneurs, start making a, uh, income on the side that we could support ourselves and then eventually go full time. And our first step in that entrepreneurial e-commerce direction was just publishing ebooks on Kindle, Kindle, Kindle Direct Publishing on Amazon. So we were just selling ebooks for 99 cents, $2.99, you know, $9.99, just trying to make a little money that way. Uh, and that was great. We did that for a while. After we started making money that way, we were like, oh, this is really cool. Like we can make a lot of money with Amazon. Uh, we learned about something called retail arbitrage, which is essentially uh, buying stuff from your local Walmart or Target or, you know, massive retailer and then reselling it online for more. And then from there, we took the profits and started importing our own products from China and Asia uh, to start selling our products online uh, with our own private label brand on the Amazon platform. And that was when we had the breakthrough to get to our current company, which is AMZ Advisors, a marketing agency for the Amazon platform. When we saw that a lot of our co- uh, competitors that were massive multinational companies were doing billions of dollars a year in revenue, were you know we were outperforming them on the Amazon platform. So we said, hey, like there's a huge opportunity to help a lot of companies achieve uh, better results on the platform, obviously make money for ourselves and build a business out of this. And since then, we haven't looked back. We're up to about 32 employees right now uh, in the US, Mexico, Europe, and Asia. And yeah, we're just continuing to grow. And we've, we've been around since, as a business, we've been around since 2015. So about six years now. Wow. In terms of your journey, did you have the plan of where you were going to move from in terms of 
you know, start with, with the eBooks and then move to this, then move to that, then start selling with the, you know, did, did you have that planned out before you started or was it just start and shift and see what the opportunities were as you, as you went along? No, we definitely, we never had that planned out. I mean, we really didn't have a solid idea of what we were going to do. Uh, you know, the fact is, uh, when we first started the e-commerce journey, there was actually four of us. We had another partner that we've since gone separate directions with. Uh, but, you know, we were all in corporate jobs. Uh, I was in real estate. Another was in, uh, two others were in recruiting. Another was in uh, project management. We were all kind of tired of working in the corporate space. You know, we didn't feel that our work was valued. So we were pretty desperate to get out. And, you know, just creating this extra income with the... Um, with the eBooks was one way to start. I mean, we, we were open to all different business ideas. We were exploring real estate, uh, investing, like any way we could kind of get our foot in the door and start going. And then finally, once we started gaining traction with the, the Kindle Direct Publishing, we started getting more exposure to uh, you know, other groups, other, um, I won't say gurus, but other people that are, are teaching people how to sell e-commerce and you know, that we just kept learning more about retail out arbitrage, private label. And then we took all the knowledge that we had learned over, you know, a year, year and a half, and then started offering it as a service to other people that had no idea what they were doing on the Amazon platform. Mm. And before we move into talking about, you know, how, you know, some tactics in terms of outreach and marketing, I want to ask you when you, when you started, you know, just, you were all in the sort of corporate world and you wanted to leave. A lot of people are in that situation where they have a job, that's not their highest excitement. It's not their passion, but they're looking to make some money on the side to hopefully one day get out and do what they love full time. Yeah. What was, what was that journey for you? Did you have any particular, any particular mindset, any particular, uh, you know, frame of mind that allowed you to move from, you know, making money on the side to then doing it full time. What was your, what was your success there? What tips would you give someone? You know, it's definitely tough. It's a very, very tough uh, process to get to that point. I mean, there's, there's a lot of risk, a lot of things that are in the way and a lot of people around you that probably, you know, some are supporting you, some are like, you know, you're an idiot. Why are you doing this? I think in my case, uh, and from my perspective, it was interesting for me because I was working at a major company, uh, Sears, you know, they've been around for a hundred, hundred years or more at that point. Um, you know, I was working on billion dollar transactions that we were doing on the real estate side, real estate side, excuse me. Um, but I could see the writing on the wall, like what felt like a, a secure job, the money I, I was making six figures, I was doing very well. Um, but I saw the company crumbling around me. We were closing stores, we were firing people, like people that had been with the company for years or maybe even decades. And that's where I started to first realize to myself that there's no such thing as a secure job uh, and that was the first like mental breakthrough I had is like, all right, like they, these companies are only as good as their leaders are and only as good as the decisions they make. If they make a wrong decision, the whole company can go bankrupt and then there goes your job. And I just kind of got to the point where I was like, well, I need to rely on myself more. And, you know, I, I never grew up an entrepreneur. I wasn't one of the kids that, you know, was going through the neighborhood, shoveling every driveway for snow or doing whatever I could to make money. That just wasn't me. I mean, I, I, was always active, but that just wasn't something I was interested in making money for myself. Um, but then once I had that breakthrough, I was kind of like, all right, now I need to do this. So primarily the first step was just figuring out how can I make some money? How can I make anything? Just, just get me started on the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial route. So I at least know the feeling, see if I like it or see if it's not for me and then go find another job. You know, there were, that was always another opportunity as well. Right. And I think that's important. Just getting that first step, making that first you know sale, making those first dollars online. Once you get a taste of that, it's so much easier. And then from there, once we had enough money that we felt, you know, we had enough money saved up, we had enough money coming in, even though it wasn't much, we were making like $3,000 a month at that point. We saw the potential for the future. And we, we were working every day after work from, I don't know, six o'clock in the at evening, six o'clock uh, in the afternoon until 11, 12 at night. And, you know, we were just like, why not just go do this full time? I mean, if we had the full eight hours during the day, plus this extra time, we could be way more successful at what we're doing than just, you know, this few hours and doing that stuff. So that is the scary leap, taking that, that leap of faith and believing you can support yourself full time. Um, I know a lot of people can probably relate to that, but 
once you see the opportunity, you have to just believe in yourself. You have to ignore the people that have that negative mindset about, you know, you're doing something crazy. It doesn't make sense. And just trust yourself, believe in what you're doing and just go for it. It's, yeah. it's hard, but especially, especially 2020, you know, people are losing their jobs all over the place and they're, they're realizing the insight you had, you know, in, in the start of your career as an entrepreneur is that the job isn't secure. The job is, yeah. that's an illusion, right? Yeah. And I love how when you say, you know, some people say, oh my God, my job's not secure and they would freak out to you. Now you're talking about that, like a huge breakthrough. Yeah. Right? You're, you're saying that insight is my breakthrough. And I'm curious, those are those who doubted you or those who thought you were crazy, they still in your life. And what do they, what do they think about your journey now? Oh yeah. I mean, I'm still friends with a lot of them. I mean, some of them were even my close family. So I mean, you know, they're, they're my family. So it's not that they were, uh, it's not that they were so opposed to it. It's just more of their background. I mean, my, my grandparents were immigrants to the U S you know, they really preached that idea of job security, even though they were entrepreneurs themselves, it was really, uh, ingrained, uh, ingrained to my parents, you know, and that's kind of what they tried to push on me. And, you know, it, I mean, it made sense to a point, but then I realized like, you know, this, this isn't what it, what it takes. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you can still have people that may not, may not believe may be negative in your life, may not be thinking about uh, the outcome of you making this decision to do something for yourself, but it doesn't mean you actually need to listen to everything they're saying. Uh, yeah. Having them around is different than actually, you know, taking what they're saying at its face value and letting it decide your own decisions. I mean, you need to, at the end of the day, you need to choose for yourself. Yeah. So it seemed like your confidence sort of started to grow. At least your, your enthusiasm and your confidence started to grow. The more you started to see what was possible. So you're like, Oh, there's some people making money online. Then you started to make money online. Even if it was just a little bit, you started to see the potential. <laughs> then you started making about 3000 a month with, with your, with your crew there. And now you're like, okay, now if we we're doing these eight hours a day, we could, we could scale this. We could move into a different realm and we could do this. We could do this full time. Do you think, having that team around you, do you think having those, those initial co-founders helped in that journey? Well, cause not a lot of people go down that route. Normally they're solopreneurs that just start off and, um, and see what they can do by themselves. Do you think that gave you a, an advantage on your path? It, it's, it's tough to say. I think at the time, I mean, at the time it, it made perfect sense for us because the three of us, we weren't completely sure if this was going to work you know, we, we saw the potential, but we, you know, we weren't positive. We didn't want to put a ton of money into our investment, into this as an investment and have it fail and lose that money. We were very cautious going into it. Um, so I think for us, it worked very well. I can see why a lot of people will go that solo entrepreneur route. And I think that's great as well. If you're able to handle the work, if you, you know, have the money, if you're not as afraid as we were at the time. Um, but in our situation, having the three of us, uh, actually worked very well because we were three partners that really complemented each other's strengths and, uh, you know, weaknesses. So for example, one of my partners that was doing the recruiting, he was fantastic at sales. So, I mean, he just naturally started leading more of the sales calls. Eventually now he heads up our entire sales department. Uh, myself, I was more focused on the actual, uh, advertising side on Amazon, the marketing side for our business and a lot of our finance stuff, uh, just because that was more of what I was comfortable with. I'm very comfortable talking in front of people, um, you know, just sharing my experience, things like that. And my other partner, uh, was a project manager and he was perfect for making sure that things actually got done. Things were done properly. And, there, you know, we were meeting deadlines. We weren't late on things. So in our situation, having the three of us together worked out perfectly. Yeah. If you're a solo entrepreneur, you can definitely make that work as well. As long as you have a system or a process to help support you, or you have, you know, a VA or someone you can start outsourcing work to, um, you know, that hundred percent works as well. I mean, you, it's obviously can be more profitable as well if you're the only one in it. Yeah. But, you know, like I said, for us, it was perfect for the three of us to get into it. Yeah. It's just something that people can think about when they're, when they're building their business, they're in the, in the mindset of, okay, I got to make this happen. How can I stick to my zone of genius? How can I align with people who are compl a complimentary fit, whether that's hiring someone, whether that's getting someone, uh, you know, getting a team member on board or building a team where they, you know, even if they're not necessarily getting, getting income, but you know, if they had to get some sort of compensation of, of other sorts, just, just thinking in ways in which you can, in which you can grow 
that is uh, that is aligned. Like say solopreneurs like myself, uh, find a way to make it work. You can find a way to stick to your zone of genius and hire people and um, and do what you can as well. But that's really cool. From working with so many business owners, what's the difference you've seen from those who have been successful, who have made it work, who have been able to do it full time and grow consistently compared to those who might stay stuck or may stay struggling? What have you noticed in terms of the patterns of the people that you work with? That's, that's definitely a very good question. Um, and it's tricky to answer as well. I mean, in our industry, we're primarily working with business owners that are working with uh, physical products. So they have a physical good they're selling online and it's, you know, I, I've done it. I've sold products online. I'm starting other brands. I have that going on. Um, physical products are still scary to me. Going out and just starting to sell goods is still a, a very scary concept in my mind because you buy a bunch of inventory, it doesn't work. And maybe it's just a mental block. I think I, I can get over that at some point, but it's just getting more comfortable in that. Um, but what I've seen from other business owners that are really good at it is that they have one strength within the business or one area of the business that they're phenomenal at. So mm-hmm. for example, some of our best clients ha- are very, very good on the uh, inventory planning, inventory management and ordering side and product sourcing. So they're very successful at their business because they handle this aspect very well. And then the other aspects that they don't do it as well, like the marketing they hand, they send to us. So I think it's always important within a business to play to your strengths. And again, this kind of goes back to the last question of having a team of three for us. You know, in any business I kind of go down, I always look for a strategic partner because I know that there's certain areas that I'm not going to be able to do well. And there's, I want that partner to be able to handle those areas well. So I think playing to your strengths is one of the biggest success uh, factors within a business. I mean, here's another great example. Uh, we've been building our own course and you know, we've created all the content for it because it's our knowledge and our expertise. However, we're not good at creating a sales funnel for a educational product or a digital product like this. We have never done it before. So we outsource that work to one of our friends who's phenomenal at it and does it for a lot of other brands. So I think figuring out what you're good at and what you're not good at is probably one of the best <laughs> things that you can do within a business. Yeah. Cause even though a lot of people listening might not have a physical product, the, the patterns, the patterns of success, especially in business transfer over to many industries. And like I'm saying, if, if someone can find a way to understand their zone of genius and what they're good at and leverage that completely, man, they can find a lot of success uh, by, by building either a team or systems or automations around that. Right. And so whether someone is a lot of, a lot of, you know, people who listen to my podcast, they have this inner gift, you know, that's their, that's their true gift. And their gift is to, um, you know, empower people or heal people or do these, you know, do these things to really uh, heighten consciousness. And that's their zone of genius. That's their gift. And I find that you can use that in your coaching, of course, and in your, in your business, but also in your marketing and in your strategy and in your collaborations with people. I mean, if that's your zone of genius, then, you know, that's what you thrive off. And that's what I, that's what I love um, people to sort of leverage and think about. So that's really cool. So moving into 2021, many opportunities, many ways in which people can, outreach their business can can set out new audiences can you know use platforms like 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 you know social media for their for their seo and things like that where do you see the opportunities right now if someone's a solopreneur or they're just getting started they're releasing content they're doing all these different things to increase their awareness Mm -hmm. what what are some of the opportunities right now that you see is uh is 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 clear in 2021 Sure. I think, I think you just actually made a very good point there. And before I get into that, you know, I think sticking to your expertise and bringing that to whatever aspect of the business you're going into, like, like marketing, this is the perfect example of using your expertise to your advantage. So for me, the biggest opportunities I see in 2021 for any business channel for, well, most online businesses are obviously YouTube creating a lot of video content on YouTube is a great way to get exposure. Use that to drive people to your website or your offer or whatever it may be. And LinkedIn, uh, especially for B2B services. I think that's very fantastic. Uh, I, you know, the numbers, the last numbers I saw is like, there's 3 billion people on LinkedIn. And I think like 3 million people are actually creating content. 
So the opportunity to create more content on that platform and reach more people is, is huge. If you're connecting with the right people, if you're getting the right engagement and building all of that. So those are like the two areas where I see probably the quickest return on your investment on making those marketing uh, changes. I think in the long term, though, I mean, SEO, you really can't beat it and doing content marketing that way. Um, you know, we started doing SEO from day one in our business uh, because we realized it was going to be important to the long run success of the business. And it, it, it's, it literally pays off so much now. I mean, we get, we get close to 1500 users a day to our website. We get almost 10 uh, leads a day just through free organic traffic. So that's a longer game. That's probably not just 2021, but it's as good a time to start now. So, you know, later this year, next year, you're really starting to see the benefits. And as long as you're consistent, putting out good content, um, you know, you're going to find, people are going to find your content. They're, they're going to come to your website and it's going to help your business grow. Great. In terms of your SEO and releasing content, we just said day one, you know, we're going to, we see the opportunity right now that to, to yeah. build and leverage this. What is it that you do for your SEO? Is it mostly, is it mostly blogs? Is it mostly things on your, on your, uh, that you put out there on other platforms so that people can, um, have that backlink to your website? Yeah. So, the, prime, the initial focus of our website, uh, at least when our process went, and I think this is a good approach for anyone to take, is that when we're starting uh, the website, we focused on creating uh, a lot of really good content for our website. So it was super in-depth, really covered a topic, focused on whatever the keyword was and created, I think we did about 10 pieces for our website, 10 to 15 maybe, uh, that was just really great content that we could have on the blog. And then from there, the next step was really doing outreach and finding other partners within the space and then finding opportunities to do content exchanges. So or content collaborations, this is something we still do every day. So we're reaching out to new companies, new websites that are related to our field. And, you know, we find a way that we can bring value to them by producing some piece of content for, for their blog or possibly a video interview or, you know, whatever that piece of content is that brings value to them. Uh, as long as it can get a link back to your website and vice versa, you give them the opportunity to get a link from your website to theirs. Mm. So that is fundamental to getting the SEO going in the right way, having good content on your website and then doing that outside of that. There are a lot of other good platforms for the SEO side, uh, obviously getting on to a lot of, uh, a lot of business listing platforms. Uh, what are they, what are they called? I can't even think right now. Um, Directories, getting onto a lot of directories and just getting your name out there where people can go find it is another great way to just get a little bit more visibility. And then trying to become a contributing writer for other uh, websites is that next step. And that's, that's something I do a lot of. So, you know, I take, I show, I create my content. I show that I know what I'm talking about. That helps me build the authority. And then I use that authority to go out to try to get onto better websites to get more traffic, to try to become a contributing writer within my space to put more content out there and have more people know my name, more people know my brand and start discovering me that way. Perfect. That is in a nutshell, my SEO strategy for going, going forward. Yeah. And no doubt that seems to build, right? The more, um, to get on larger platforms, you need that authority. You need that social proof. So the more you can sh show that, the more you can, place yourself on bigger platforms, which gives you more social proof. Right. And then, so that exactly. sort of just feeds in on itself. It seems. Exactly. I mean, my goal uh, personally is I want to be a contributing writer for Inc. Uh, I want to be for Inc entrepreneur fortune. I want to be on all those. That's where I want to be giving my value because that's where the most eyeballs are, but I know to get there, there's a lot of other ones on the way. So for example, right now I do a lot of contributing writing work for business to community.com and also for business.com. So those are, they're reputable, reputable websites. A lot of people see that, but by publishing more content on there and building a bigger reputation, hopefully down the road, going to a bigger website and a bigger resource like fortune or Inc or entrepreneur, you know, they, they're maybe more familiar with me. They've at least seen examples of my published content on related websites. And then maybe that's good enough for them to let me one day write a piece for them. We'll find out. <laughs> yeah. But it's all about that collaboration. And how did you start that in terms of when you're, when you, you're, you're not a writer yet, or you haven't done necessarily pieces of content with collaborations before, how did you reach out to those initial, initial companies to be a contributing writer or to, or to, you know, be to contribute to their content on their, on their platforms? 
Yeah. So I just started by doing a lot of research. I put together a list of about 20 different websites. Uh, some of them are easier to get onto than others. Uh, and like there were other ones before that, that I was writing uh, other ones to the ones I'm writing for right now that were, you know, weren't as reputable or didn't have as great a name. So just starting on the small ones, getting on there and showing that you can publish content for other websites is really the way to start if you're going to do contributing writing. Uh, and then leverage whatever website you're on to kind of get to that next tier and then keep trying to move up, cre keep creating good content. Obviously that's very important. Start doing that. Um, I think when it comes to the actual writing piece of it, a lot of people probably don't trust their own writing ability as much as they should. But I think the reality is if you make something that's easy to be read, that provides a lot of value, you know, if you're repetitive in some words you use or it doesn't flow perfectly for everyone, it doesn't matter. As long as the value is there and you're actually putting out the content, it's going to be valuable to someone. They're going to enjoy it. You know, it's going to hopefully lead to some benefit for you. And at the same time, just getting started is going to improve your writing over time. It's going to improve your vocabulary, how much easier it is for you to do it. Um, or if it's not something, if it's really something you don't enjoy, you can find a ghostwriter. So you can hire a VA, you can hire, uh, you know, ghostwriting agencies to just put the content together for you. And then you can publish it on the websites. I mean, I, I personally enjoy writing, uh, and I do have content writers as well. So it really depends on the situation, but you know, it's, it, you just got to get started, uh, and then start getting it out there and just keep trying to get on the bigger platforms to reach a larger audience. It's like, it's like anything. Yeah. You just, you start and then you just improve as you go along. Yeah. You, you work on, you find out what works, what doesn't work. You, you improve your own skills and that confidence <laughs> yeah. shines through the more you do it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's for sure. Um, I, when I was first starting this business, I, we were talking about roles within the business, like what we were going to handle. And I was like, Oh, you know, I came from real estate development. I understand finance. I'm going to do our finance. And then the reality is the finance aspects of the business are probably like the smallest stuff. I, I spend like maybe three hours a month on it. So then I was like, all right, well, what am I going to do? And marketing just kind of continued to evolve into a role. And it's something that's constantly ongoing. It's one of the most important things to any business is just getting your name out there and getting your brand uh, recognized by other people. And it's something I enjoy a lot. Uh, my background was not in it at all. And it's, it's just really fun to put out content like yeah. videos like this written content, webinars. I just did a Facebook live today. You know, I, it's fun. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Many people do. Many people love putting out content, doing their own videos. A lot of people have their own Facebook groups and they just love doing, you know, adding value in there as they can building communities, that sort of thing. Where, yeah. where do you, where do you see the uh, people can start in getting their, getting their keywords right? Cause I know a lot of people can do a lot of content, put it out there and do it on blogs and videos and things of that nature. What, what, what are your tips in terms of, in terms of finding those keywords that they can utilize? Yeah. So I think there, it depends on the platform, obviously. Uh, if you're going to go the YouTube route, I think something that is phenomenal that you can use is called uh, tube buddy. Uh, I think it's TubeBuddy.com, like the end of YouTube uh, buddy. And uh, I've, I've been using that for my videos and the SEO has improved on them a lot. It gives you a lot of the tags that you need to use within your content, shows you where you should be putting the keywords within uh, the, the, the copy, the description, the title, all of that stuff. So there's a lot of good stuff there for that tool. When it comes to building your own website or your own blog, uh, it's a little bit more challenging. There's a lot of different tools out there. The one that I personally use right now is ahrefs.com. Uh, it's phenomenal for doing research on, you know, top keywords, uh, questions. That's another big one. If someone's asking, going to Google and asking a question, you should write a piece of content about that. Uh, how do you do this? Well, here's my content. That's a great example of one way to start creating content. Um, but just doing keyword research and figuring out who, who your competitors are and using a tool like Ahrefs. There's other tools out there like SEMrush. Uh, Mozilla is another one or no Moz.com is another one. Um, there's a lot of different ones. I, I personally like Ahrefs and I've gotten really good results with it. So I kind of just stuck with that. Awesome. Beautiful. So now people can start to piece together where they can, you know, how they can utilize the content they're putting out there. Yeah. What, what content itself do you use? Do you use a lot of how to's or do you share stories or do you share, you know, examples? What, what, what sort of content do you find, you know, works the best, especially if you're, you know, pitching to other, 
other um, platforms that you're looking to contribute to? So, okay, there, I think there's two good questions there or two good answers there. The first one is uh, how to's. I think that's incredibly valuable. If you can, pro you can provide a lot of value to people if you teach them the right way to do something. And if you go through Google, a lot of commonly searched terms are how do I do this? What is this? Why, why do I do this? Blah, 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 all those types of questions and being able to answer those directly with a piece of content provides a lot of value to them. It's also a longer tail uh, keyword by providing like, how do I make chocolate muffins, for example? I mean, I mean food's a bad example because everyone dominates that, but um, keywords like that, if you literally create a piece of content, how to create chocolate muffins, you're gonna have, probably have a good chance of actually showing up for that over time. So actually like going that way is a great way to get started by doing SEO content, uh, providing value in, in your target audience's life somehow or answering a question they may have. Um, and then the, the second part there is, uh, when I'm doing the outreach, this is obviously something that's a lot harder. Um, if you're doing like a, a content collaboration with another website or an exchange like that, you could, t you usually have a conversation on, uh, something that you can write for them and then something they can write for you. So it's a little bit easier when you have someone else working with you. If you're proposing ideas to a website, like uh, to become a contributing writer, for example, it's a lot more challenging. You want to make sure that the piece of content you're creating is going to be, you know, very big. It's going to provide a lot of value. Like, for example, some of the uh, top contributing posts I've written are, you know, 3000 words or more, which is extremely long for SEO. But there's so many different aspects within that. I wanted to show that I knew what I was talking about. I was well researched. I had a lot of value and a lot of pieces in there. In proposing something like that to a website to become a contributing writer and detailing exactly what that article is, is a great way to kind of get, is a great way to increase the likelihood that it's going to be accepted. And once you start going that way, you know, even if it gets rejected from web, one website, you still have a great idea for a piece of content that you can take to someone else. So just being rejected by someone doesn't mean it's the end of the world. Just keep moving and keep finding someone else to publish your content. Yeah. And that's, it, it, it almost goes without saying, but I know there are so many people out there who would get rejected once and be like, oh, this isn't the path for me, yeah. right? It's kind of just like, a, it is a numbers game. Um, and even the journey in of itself helps you build that character, right? Helps you build that resilience and, and that resourcefulness to, to move forward with it. Because like I said before, if you're sticking to your zone of genius and you love video or you love writing, or you just love doing podcast interviews like this and just having conversations, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever way resonates with you in your content, you know, if that's your zone of genius, you're going to give a lot of value, right. In a, in a For particular sure. form so that the, the person you're collaborating with can see that. Cause if you, if you love video and you love jumping on and you love the, the tech of your, of your microphone and then the, and then the photos and then the video and all those different things, you know, that's going to, that, that, that passion is going to come across and the value you're going to give in that piece of content is more likely to be of value. And so if it's what you would do, regardless of if it pays off or not, um, then, you know, there's, there's so many opportunities to collaborate with people and reach out and pitch your idea and help them as they help you all those different things. Right. Anything else, anything else you want to add on that? No, I think you made a really good point there. And I would say just because if you feel like you're getting rejected for something frequently, Maybe it's just not the right time to, to approach that. Maybe there's another piece of content that you'll have more like uh, more luck with just by getting out there and, and trying it. Or maybe it's another medium. Maybe it's not writing. Maybe you're better at video and you just don't know it yet. So if something doesn't work right away, don't feel like it's the end of the world. You can always revisit it later and try creating content that way. But maybe you'll stumble upon something else that's great. Like video for you could be phenomenal. YouTube might drive a, a ton of sales for you podcasting might get a lot of leads. There's a lot of different ways to approach it. So don't, like you said, don't get too frustrated. Don't give up. Just keep trying to find the content that's working for you and yeah. go in that direction. Has there been any moments of your journey where you've just, you've felt doubt or fear or frustration, whether it be starting, whether it be finding your initial sales, whether it be, whether it be scaling and building this team, like I said, you have 16 people in, in Mexico <laughs> Uh, yeah. just alone right so is was there any part of the journey where you where you truly just felt like oh my god is this for me or or just the whole time did you just think it was in flow i think 
Well, I, I mean, you, you're always going to feel these doubts, I guess, at certain points in your business. I think the first time I really felt it is when we were kind of trying to shift from, you know, the three founders doing all the work to having employees to do the work. That was the first time where we, I was literally at the point where I was working from, you know, eight o'clock in the morning when I woke up until nine o'clock at night, nonstop, barely eating, taking a break to go to the gym. And that was like it. And I was like, I can't live this way forever. I need to figure this out. So that was the first point where I was like, if it continues this way, I don't know if I can keep doing it. And that's where we had to make the shift to start hiring people. Um, and that's a scary shift too. I mean, you get to the point where can I trust this person to actually keep my business going in the right direction? I mean, that's another huge step of trust and making sure that you can get, keep your product quality high while you're reducing the amount of work that you're actually doing. Um, that was another point. Um, earlier this year with uh, the pandemic breaking out, you know, a lot of clients left uh, just because they were afraid of their own situations. They were afraid of money. Um, you know, I was afraid that, you know, we were going to go out of business. I mean, we were fine, but, you know, I was afraid like nine, 10 clients left in one month. And I'm like, well, what if another nine, 10 clients left? I mean, that's, that's almost, you know, 40% of our total clients right there. And then that's, that's a scary moment as well. And I think, we had to look at the business and see what the issues were. Um, us as owners had to take less money so we could make sure that we could pay to our employees. But we realized that, you know, if we keep going in this direction, we just have to get to the point where either we're going to have to let our team go, which is a very hard thing to do, or we're going to have to just keep paying ourselves nothing until we get the business right on the back on the right track. It's a very stressful moment as well. Um, you know, this 2020 was a, a scary time. Yeah. Uh, um, and, you know, for a lot of business owners too, I, I think they're still having a hard time trying to figure everything out. Totally. So, so what, ended, what ended up happening? Did you end up just taking a, uh, the founders taking a pay cut and then keeping your employees um, working until things started picking up again? Is that what happened? Yeah, that's, uh, that's more or less what happened. We, uh, took we definitely took a big pay hit for about two months, uh, which was tough. So we had to you know kind of dip into our savings to keep everything going in the right direction. But we saw the opportunity that was coming. We were like, you know, this can't go on forever. Um, you know, things are going to have to open back up once that, you know after a while. And uh, the great thing is for us, we were also in the e-commerce space. So after about that first month and a half, we started getting a lot of interest to our website, a lot of people that wanted help. And we were like, all right, like, this is fine. You know, this was a big hiccup that we hit, but it's out of our control. All we can kind of do is focus on going forward. So luckily after that, I mean, we gained way more clients after, you know, the, the last eight months of, or last nine months, or sorry, seven months of 2020. Um, to make up for everything we lost plus more. So, you know, it was just that scary moment of doubt and having, uh, you know, doubt in yourself, I guess, and whether your business is actually going to succeed. But yeah. you just got to get through it. And, you know, either you're going to find out that it's, it's if it doesn't work, worst case scenario, this is always why I say, wait, worst case scenario, if my business fails and I need to go get a job, at least for a short time, I'm going to be able to get a job anywhere I want because I'm an expert in my field you know, my story, my resume is interesting because I started my own business. I ran my own business. I grew my own business. Um, and you know, you go to any interview and you tell them that story, they're going to be blown away. Like everybody wants more entrepreneurs within their business. So, you know, you really can't go wrong. If some things get uncertain, just keep, do your best to get back on track, keep things going. And at the end of the day, if it doesn't work out, that's not the end of the world. Yeah. I think that's what the, a lot of people listening can, can feel is that, it's, you know, even on the entrepreneurial journey, who you're becoming is so valuable because you're focused not only on the internal growth and overcoming all these patterns of the fears, doubts, and frustrations, but your, your commitment to service and your commitment to making a contribution and building something of value that offers so much in the marketplace, in business, to your clients. So who you're becoming on this journey is key. And like you say, if, if everything fails, that backup plan is there. That sort of, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily a backup plan, but that option is always there. And this entrepreneurial journey is helping you with that. Right. Cause yeah. you're, you're just that much more valuable. I love that. Sure. I love that. So 
is there anything else that's coming through? Anything else that you want to add in terms of talking about and talking about the, the content or talking about uh, hiring, building a team, anything like this that you think will help someone moving forward in, in 2021? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, I mean, maybe your audience is a little bit different, but I think when a lot of people think of e-commerce, at least from what I'm used to and in my perspective and normal conversations I have with people that aren't in this space, they really think about building, uh, you know, a physical product and selling it online and making money that way. But in reality, we, we all know that's not what e-commerce is. E-commerce is also selling digital products. It's also selling business uh, B2B services. I mean, our, our offices are in uh, Connecticut in the U.S. and here in Mexico, but we've never met. We've, well, I don't want to say we never. We've only met a select few clients in person. Everything else has been online. So there's a lot of opportunities to build an e-commerce business that has nothing to do with actual physical goods. And you know, getting to that step of where you're actually going to be growing and deciding you know, how you're going to hire, how you're going to bring people on is important. You know, if you're a solo entrepreneur, maybe you're making enough money where you can hire someone in the US or you can hire someone in Canada or wherever you may, Australia, wherever you may be, uh, to help you grow that business. But a lot of times people look towards other resources. So uh, hiring virtual assistants is very popular. Um, you know, in the US, it's, in Canada, it's very popular to send that work over to the Philippines or to India. But the challenge we had with that was that, you know, we were dealing with different time zones. Uh, the communication issues were a problem. We had problems with uh, infrastructure reliability and just missing people that way. So for us, we found the opportunity to actually create an office here in Mexico, which was literally right next door on the same time zones, which made it very convenient for our content teams to be able to talk with our clients. At this point, we even have our client facing teams here in Mexico talking with our US clients. And uh, obviously the cost is extremely uh, lower compared to the US or compared to Canada. And you know, we didn't have the issues with the reliability. We also had a lot of uh, similar work habits between people in the US and between Mexico. I mean, in, in our case, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people in Mexico were born in the US or spent significant time in the US and came back to Mexico. So they have extremely strong English skills. So for us, hiring in Mexico is a no-brainer. Um, and I think a lot of businesses can leverage that depending on where they are. I mean, if, in your, if you're in Europe, there's Eastern Europe has a lot of great talent. Uh, Portugal is another place to find cheap, great talent. Or even if in, in the same time zone, if you look at South Africa, there's a lot of great English-speaking talent there if your audience is English-speaking. Mm. In the Americas, there's a ton. I mean, we use Mexico. A lot of people use Colombia uh, or Argentina, even Brazil. Uh, it, it really depends. I mean, Again, in our situation, we really believe Mexico is great. Uh, and we prefer that to, to using VAs to grow our business because we have someone who's a full-time employee now for probably half or a third of the cost it would cost us in the U.S. Beautiful. I love, there's so many options of people, how they can build, how they can expand, whether it's collaboration, building their, um, building their skills in, in, in contributing, obviously building their skills in terms of a team, and doing and doing what you've done, sticking to their zone of genius is is something that feels aligned as well. The more you stick to that, the more you 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 truly expand. And and as long as you overcome the fear of like delegating some tasks yeah. and that trust, finding the right people is key. But like you say, if you if if you can feel out what works for you, if someone's in your time zone, if someone has those skills that uh, are needed, whether it be even speaking, writing skills, you know, tech and, and graphics, all those different things to have the skills that are necessary. Um, what's it been like for you? What's it been like for you in building a team? Uh, do you feel, do you feel like you're contributing because you're allowing these people to do what they love and have a job or, or is it, is it something else? What, what's your, what's your primary focus when, when you think about building a team? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's a two-way street. I think it's one that the team member needs to be able to bring value to our team, but we also need to be able to provide security, a great work environment, and a good team and good, uh, good equipment, everything they need to actually succeed at what their job is and to give them that opportunity to advance. So, you know, in exchange for, for the value they can bring and the expertise that they're bringing, we want to make sure that we're giving all of that back to them and more. The reason that we kind of focused on hiring outside of the U.S. instead of hiring in the U.S. is just because we didn't have the money. You know, the reality is we could have hired someone and taken the value they had, but the reality is we couldn't have given as much back to them. We couldn't give them the opportunity to advance. We couldn't give them 
a great workspace or great benefits. Yeah. So for us being able to hire in Mexico, we were able to you know, create a great work environment where we could actually at a lower cost, hire, hire people, provide them with everything they needed to be happy with their, their work situation, with their life and be able to grow their business. At the same time, it also feels great for us because I mean, we're in Mexico, I think we're in Guadalajara, Mexico, um, and, and Mexico city and Monterey as well. But in Mexico, I think the youth unemployment rate is about 37% and that's people under 29, I think. Um, which is high when you think about it, because all of these people are extremely literate when it comes to technology or to computers, um, you know, and the workforce in Mexico is much more focused on manufacturing and tourism than it is on business services. Um, so there's a great opportunity for us to actually help a lot of people by providing them jobs to build a team here, give them the opportunity to grow, learn more about e-commerce. Cause I mean, the reality is e-commerce doesn't exist down here. Um, not like it does in the U S not like it does in Canada or other countries. So there no, there were very few businesses, almost none down here that we were doing what we were doing. So we gave a lot of people the opportunity to learn a new skill, to get into e-commerce and kind of grow that way. And you know, we really enjoy it. We feel good about it. And, you know, we believe our employees enjoy it as well. Cause we've never had one leave in three years here in Mexico. You must be, that's a sign you're doing something right. It's definitely a sign you have a, a coercive team. And I love the focus, not only where you're hiring someone they you know, they're adding value to you. But your yeah. focus also is, is making sure they have everything they need to succeed and to grow and to, you know, and to expand it in their own right. So where yeah. can, where can people find out more about you find out more about uh, AMZ advisors and, and what you guys offer as a service as well? For sure. Uh, if they're looking for e-commerce help, they can reach out to us directly at amzadvisors.com or you can email me directly at mike at amzadvisors.com. Uh, if you have any questions about you know, marketing, uh, near shoring your workforce in Mexico, whatever it may be, you can also email me as well. I'm always glad to help you share my experience, uh, show you how you can actually help that, use those services to help grow your business and actually achieve more in 2021. So feel free to reach out if there are any, ever any questions. I'm always glad to help. Beautiful. Amazing. If there, is there anything else that you think uh, you'd like to share any other tips or wisdom from your experience that would help this, you know, help this come together in a, in a, in a nice, uh, nice interview? No, I think we covered a lot there. Obviously, you know, we focused a lot on growing the businesses, the mentality it takes, the marketing you can do and how you can actually build teams. I think that's incredibly valuable to a lot of businesses that really are ready to take that next step, but don't know exactly what they're doing or exactly what steps they need to take. So I hope we provide a lot of value there. Um, but again, if there's any, anything that's not clear, just feel free to reach out. I'm always glad to help. So. Awesome. And I want to acknowledge you for trusting yourself and going with your heart. You know, definitely when you're <laughs> leaving a job and you're expanding into online entrepreneurship, it can be scary, but it's what you felt exciting. It's what you felt you'd love to do. And, uh, and, and that's why it's expanding. So thank you for all the work you're doing and helping so many people build their online businesses and providing the freedom that you found as well. I think it's really, really inspiring and congrats on all the success and what you're doing now. It's just really, really cool. So thanks for being here. No doubt everyone's going to reach out to you and, uh, and reach out for your services because we need help with this sort of area. If it's not our area of expertise, but it's definitely where the opportunity is. So thanks so much for your time, Mike. Thank you so much for having me here. You know, I really enjoyed it and I just hope everyone found it valuable.